Jace. Jason Derulo with a wiggle on 88.2 Sanyu FM. It's a hit selector. And joining me right now on Celeb Select, I would like to invite Kemi, a.k.a. Chemistry. Uh, I think real names, Kemiondo yes. Cotinho. Welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It's, it's nice and cool inside. It's hot outside, man. Yes, it's crazy hot out Woo. there. So there's some lovely AC to help you yeah, get settled. Man. Come through 88.2 FM. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the big hair. What's with the big hair today? Because oh. you're always changing your look. I think a lot of people have been saying that and I've never noticed it. But yeah, I think I changed my hair quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I think it's coming from the States where I couldn't afford to go to the salon <laughs> at all. And now I'm like, what? I can change my hair for $10? I might do this every two weeks. Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, welcome to the show. We want to get to know you better. Yes. You recently tweeted, I think, uh, that when you're in the States... Yeah, yes. people say you're African. Yes. Then when you're in Uganda, people say you're South African. When yes. you're in South Africa, people say you're Ugandan. Yes. So we need to understand where that's all coming from. Yes, let's figure it out. Where were you born? So I was born in Swa uh, I was born in Uganda, mm -hmm. and then three weeks later, I moved to Swaziland. Okay. And so I grew up in Swaziland till I was thirteen, mm -hmm. and then my parents moved back. Okay. to Uganda mm -hmm. but then I stayed in boarding school in Swaziland ah, okay. so I would come back every three months and then go there and then I came back to Uganda for nine months then I went and I got a scholarship to the States mm -hmm. so I went to the States and then I was there for eight years and then I came back scholarship scholarship tell us more so basically I went to a high school that is connected to a bunch of uh, colleges within the States mm -hmm. and so if you get in they give you ten thousand dollars and then if the school really wants you, they add another $10,000. Okay. So, so the I school really wanted you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a uh, really good scholarship to go to the school. And then um, I thought I was going to come back. But then I auditioned for drama school. Mm -hmm. And I got another scholarship for that one. Too. Okay. Yes. All right. And um, so you're an actress. Yes. You're a playwright as well. Yes. Have you always been busy in the arts? Were you this child at home? You were staging productions. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, for as long as I remember, I was always imagining scenarios, some even morbid scenarios. Like, I remember, like, imagining funerals and what I would be saying. Like, I'd act everything out. What um, you'd say at someone else's funeral? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, like, imagine everything. And my mom was telling me the other day, she was like, I was never shocked that you were a one-woman showist. <laughs> She's like, when I was busy, I'd put you on the phone, mm -hmm. and I'd be like, talk to the Queen of England, or talk to... President uh, Nelson Mandela and I'd be having these like long conversations <laughs> with no one on the end. I realize I'm sounding a little crazy right now. But then one day she found me crying uh -huh. with a conversation. Like I was so in the conversation. Like, And I was like, this person said this. My mom was like, Whoa, no more of these <laughs> That, that's kind of close <laughs> to like the imaginary friend and yeah. how scary that is for African parents. Yes, yeah, like what definitely. Do you mean, My imaginary? mom was like, oh, now she's crying. <laughs> so she's like, yeah, I was never, you always had an overly active imagination. Okay. So definitely, I would say that it was a calling more than a career. All right. Okay, so um, your mom, your name, Cotino, is yes. not a Ugandan name. It is not. And then you said, oh, they came back to Uganda. Yes. So, so my mom is full motor. Okay. My dad is the Katogo in that mix. Oh. So, you know, there's a bunch of Ugandans that are like from Goa, right? Mm -hmm. So, Goa is a Portuguese colony, mm -hmm. hence the name Cotino. Mm -hmm. So, it's actually Coutinho or some. Coutinho. Yeah. Okay. Like, I'll try and say but that. But right. we don't say that. No, no, no. You, you I say Coutinho as in. <laughs> I, psh, there's no Portuguese <laughs> here. So, mm -hmm. um, my grand. My grandma's father mm -hmm. was from Goa. Okay. And my grandmother's mother was Congolese. Mm. So there's... It's an interesting mix. Yes. And then my father's father's French. So there's French, Indian, Congolese, mm. Ugandan. Oh, all yeah, the Katogo, things. like you Proper said. Katogo. <laughs> <laughs> so when you decided, I mean, when you stayed on in boarding school, did you miss your family? Yes, at are first. You, are you an only child? No, no, mm. I'm, I'm one of three. Okay. But I am the youngest child. But um, the difference was I went to boarding school and then three months later my mom left. Mm. I was so destroyed. <laughs> I was so destroyed. I'd I never been imagine. away. Mm. And then 
my dad left after four months. So then it was really hard for the first year. Mm. And then in the second year, I would never want to come back. It was the opposite because boarding school was so fun. It was made so much fun. Honestly, my high, you know how people describe university as where they find themselves. Mm -hmm. For me, it was my high school because it was a very special high school. We had 58 different nationalities uh -huh. that came to our high school. Okay. So it taught me a lot of things about how people are different and that difference doesn't make anyone a threat. Mm -hmm. um, and so inadvertently, it taught me a lot of things and a lot of things that I now express. Okay. You know. Do you have friends from back then? Have you held on tight to oh, some yeah. of those friendships? Actually... My bestest friend in the whole wide world <laughs> the is whole from wide world. yes yes she's the first lady of the church as I say um, she's from my high school I'm going to a wedding next week from mm -hmm. one of my other best friends from oh, my high school that's nice our high school tends to keep their friends because I mean you're just in this boarding school in the middle of nowhere in Swaziland mm -hmm. <laughs> it 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 honestly I say is the most defining it was my defining moment of childhood okay well you said your art, arts for you were a calling theater was a calling um, when did you actually start to write so what happened was I was always an actress and I wanted to continue acting and in my final year of high school we had to uh, take on a project so you could direct a play or you could act in a play and I really wanted to act in a one woman show because I'd seen it mm -hmm. and I thought that that was the most uh, tangible version of magic that I'd seen like someone literally changing before your mm -hmm. eyes into different characters mm -hmm. but I knew I wanted to do it about an African woman mm -hmm. and I looked and I looked and I looked for three months uh -huh. and never found not one play not one woman show. They were about white Africans. They were about white South Africans. But nothing about African women? Nope. Nothing. Okay. So at 17, I had a lot of guts. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to write this thing. Probably something I'd never do now. Because, you know, when you grow up, you're, you have more sense. <laughs> and that's more insecurities. <laughs> so I was like, no, it's fine. I'll just go write this thing. So I interviewed uh, Swazi women. Mm. And then it turned out to be a really feminist piece. So I started to figure out at that age. Now I'm very impressed by me at 17. At that, age. At that time I didn't. You're like, what? I, yeah. Because at 17 I was able to figure out that all the issues they were speaking about mm -hmm. all related to them being a woman. So whether it was HIV, whether it was domestic abuse, I was like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. This is all because they're women. So I, I wrote a piece called Jabulile, which was my first feminist piece. And it went on to tour in South Africa, in the States, in Canada. And that was the beginning of my writing journey. At 17? At 17. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I have many more questions. <laughs> but now I will ask you for your first request. Yes. Which is a Beyonce song. Flawless. I, I believe you're a huge Beyonce yes. fan. Yes. I'm not, you know, I'm like, I'm like you're a sure? huge. I've seen you on Twitter. Okay. I defend her endlessly. I'm like a huge fan, but I'm not like... I'm a, like my co-wife. Shout out <laughs> to my co-wife Seema. Always <laughs> talks about the. Sometimes there's the beehive can be like if Beyonce slays her child, like literally kills her child. There'll some people be like, yes, yes we're gonna kill it, her. It, I'm there's not almost that, a little bit of madness. I'm there. not that level. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I really like her. I respect that she really has complete creative control. Mm -hmm. That's something I strive to be, mm -hmm. and I think she's embraced her sexuality, which is not something we've seen in women a lot. Yes, and so I'm I'm a fan. You're a fan. I'm part of the beehive. Okay, <laughs> so here it is. Beyonce's. Flawless. <laughs> no surprise there. <laughs> Chardonnay's going touchdowns on your runway. I'm sick as forever like Bombay. It is a hit selector on 88.2 Stan UFM and I'm chatting with Kemi right now on a celeb select. Now, you are telling us how at the age of 17. You know we're all looking at you like, what do you mean? <laughs> I mean, at 17, most of us were just holding hands. <laughs> you right. were writing plays, telling stories about the <laughs> African woman. Well, at that time, I think you said like you toured a lot with that play. And I think you were labeled an activist as well as a feminist. Mm, yes. But you have an issue with the activist. No, it's not Definition? so much that I have an issue. I just think I respect activists a lot. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't categorize mm -hmm. my work as an activist. Otherwise, I would be a lazy activist, I think. Okay. Um, but I think when people watch my work, a lot of them think like, oh, she must be an activist. Okay. Um, 
And I think in some, in some ways I am. I think all theater, all art should be in some way take a form of activism. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I, like even that piece, at first I used to, when I was 17, I was like, I'm not a feminist, I'm an equal opportunist. Because mm -hmm. I never really understood the term feminist. Mm -hmm. And when I grew up and I started reading more, I learned that feminism is just means you want the same for your daughters, you want for your son, you want the same for your female friend as you want for your male friend. And I'm like, this is what my stories are about. Okay. And so that's more a term I relate to. Okay, now speaking of feminism, I mean, we've seen quite a few displays and examples that are actually chipping away at what feminism is all about. So w what do you feel like you work for, you strive for as a feminist? So I actually don't... I mean, you hear of like free the nipple campaign, yes. things like that. I, I'm all for it, mm -hmm. you know. I, I don't think there's one way to be a feminist. I don't, I don't believe that you should be one thing and then that's the correct way to be a feminist mm. i think it's all what you feel you are doing to improve equal opportunity in workplaces in safe spaces in education whether that means freeing your nipple to mean that you should have the same opportunity as a man running down the street <laughs> with his top off mm -hmm. that's up to you um i really stray away from telling people how they should be a feminist mm -hmm. i personally I use Twitter a lot, mm. you know. Yep. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know that, <laughs> either through crossing me or, <laughs> or <laughs> oh being yes, you might have seen a, a, some <laughs> serious tweets here. <laughs> but mostly through my work, uh, okay. I wrote a film um, that is coming out in May called Chemvu, which is about miniskirt harassment. Mm -hmm. um, all my plays, Kawuna is about HIV positive women in Uganda. Mm -hmm. um, and then even my pilots that I write uh, for TV, they mm. all take on that form of trying to tell the narrative. I guess if you, to answer your question mm -hmm. is I'm interested in how do we tell the female narrative in a way that's not been heard or rather in a way that's been ignored. Okay. All right. Yes. So after that first play at the age of 17, what was the next step for you in your life? What did you do after that? So I went to, so I was doing it from 2007 to about 2010. Ooh, um, that's three years. While I was in school and so forth. So the next thing I did was I wrote Kawuna because mm -hmm. I was scared. Uh, to be honest, that's why it took me that long. I was scared that I couldn't actually write. And this was a fluke. Imposter syndrome mm -hmm. is very real for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I still am like, oh, man, I'm conning this. Like, why is Crystal inviting me <laughs> to this show? <laughs> she doesn't really know that I'm not really, you know. So I was scared. And I was like, no, you have to write another play. Mm -hmm. And I was scared to write about Uganda because uh, for a long time I didn't feel really accepted in okay. Uganda yeah. a lot of people would and now I just embrace it that okay you're different you're not you know what every people see but I was so scared because I felt like so many people saw me as the other okay and I didn't want to come and write about like an outsider yeah mm -hmm. but I didn't feel like an outsider my, my, like I, I felt like this was my home yes. so eventually I just let go of the fear and it was all me. It had nothing to do with it. I just did the show <laughs> four months ago. And, like, the response was great. I'm like, Kimmy, you just created that whole thing in your head, which mm. we do often. Which is what we do all the time. Yeah. You were like, no, they, they're going to think this. But anyway, so I just did it. And then it got chosen to be at the main festival in South Africa, mm -hmm. which is very meaningful to me because uh, it was the first Ugandan show that was ever represented at that festival mm -hmm. and it's like a huge it's like the second largest festival in the world mm -hmm. um and that meant something to me to share those voices mm. and then i continued to tour that i didn't really tour it i did it in a bunch of places san francisco portland and then uganda mm -hmm. um but then i did a festival that was called nuvo arts festival that was geared at it was called HIV AIDS, no statistics. So mm -hmm. we did different events, plays, fashion, uh, music, poetry, all geared at telling the story behind HIV versus the statistics. Mm -hmm. So I've just been doing a lot of, I guess you could say, art activism <laughs> <laughs> since then. And then I fell into TV, writing for TV. Uh -huh. So now I'm really interested in that. Then I filmed... 
I've been filming a bunch this year, and then I did music a music video. Oh my! Yeah, you, you did a music video? Yeah, I, I wrote the script for George the Poet's music video, mm -hmm. um, "Wake Up." Okay. And so I produced it, and then I did the concept. Basically, again, <laughs> I took uh, the story of Cinderella and I switched it around, mm -hmm. and I made Cinderella Bordarella, <laughs> and I made the prince a princess, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I wanted to explore. Uh, the economy differences in Uganda. So that's really, I love doing that. I love taking like something like a music video or a, a, a hip hop artist or, you know, a rap artist mm -hmm. and putting a really deep, spin to it. to it yeah yeah she's I always like looking for the deep meaning <laughs> <laughs> that's what she's saying she's like, i'm looking for the deepness <laughs> and everything the depth yeah um okay so now i'm going to ask you for your second request fella kuti yes fella mm -hmm. kuti zombie that's the one i chose yes yes i love i love okay so w in 2010 mm -hmm. i watched fella on broadway and I was so embarrassed I didn't know who Fela was at that time. Okay. I had heard his music. I knew him as an artist, but I didn't know him as an, uh, you know, he was a huge activist. Mm -hmm. He was very instrumental in a lot of things that we do today as a whole. Um, but I didn't know his backstory. And I was so like, why am I learning about this in America? But anyway, <laughs> it was just the most phenomenal play I've ever seen in my life. And like, it really made me appreciate African culture and how I can put it on stage. And Zombie is one of the songs that I listen to often, and it just it reminds me of a little country I know. <laughs> okay, all right. So here it is, Zombie. Attention, quick match, slow match, left on, right on, right on, double on, salute, put your hand, turn the piece, fall in, fall out, fall down, get ready. Someone has probably seen you because you are very vocal on Twitter yes. and on Snapchat. You are. Uh, I have a hmm. different persona on Snapchat. I know. Yeah, a lot of people who followed me on Twitter and then followed me on Snapchat was like, like, "Is this the same person?" I didn't know you were funny. I'm like, "Yeah, I'm funny, and I will <laughs> come at you if you come at me wrong." <laughs> <laughs> so on Twitter, you're very big as well. Um, you have about twenty four thousand. I have no idea. I think, I think so. somewhere there. I think someone pointed it out to me actually. Oh, like, oh my goodness! Oh, she has <laughs> this many followers. So yeah. how, how do you share your life on social media? Because it feels like you do share a lot of yourself and a lot of what's happening in your life on social media. I know it feels that way. Mm. It's it's actually really interesting because I'm actually very private, mm. um, <laughs> and people don't actually realize that. Um, I choose very carefully what I share. I'm very intentional. I'm very big on signs. I'm a Virgo. Mm. So we're very intentional. I know everything I tweet. I know where it's gearing. I know what it, how it will make me look. And I actually always weigh those things out. Mm -hmm. But if you've noticed, I don't actually post about my private life too much. Um, I'll tell stories of my past. I'll tell stories of things that happened a year, six months ago. But no one actually really <laughs> knows what I'm doing. And that includes work. Uh, you only find out about projects after. Mm -hmm. I never talk about projects before. Because mm -hmm. I, I hesitate to speak before the eggs have hatched. You okay, know? okay. Um, but I think social media is a very powerful tool. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're not afraid of that tool, you can use it. Uh, you know, like even Akadope. I cannot say that it would not have been a success without Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think when people feel like they know you and like they have a sense of who you are because I am active on Twitter a lot, mm -hmm. I think they will root for you. And, and I have a personality that you like me or you don't like me or you're confused <laughs> a little bit. You're and in you there. you choose like not to like me. <laughs> and I'm okay with that, mm -hmm. you know. But I think then what happens is the people who do like you and who are drawn to you, they will ride hard for you. And so that's kind of been my relationship with Twitter. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, um, for many people who didn't know about your, your plays and what you were doing before, a lot of people got to see you on Discover Uganda. Oh, yeah. Yes. Gosh, you did that back TV show. Yes. Saturday. Uh-huh. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so how was that for you? Because you, you talked about wanting to come back home, yeah. wanting to fit in again, and then you got to explore Uganda. Exactly. So that was a joke. 
um, when I applied for it. Okay. I, I saw it on Twitter mm -hmm. that they were looking for a host. And I was like laughing with my roommate. I'm like, yo, I should apply to do this. And she's like, ha ha. And she's like, come, <laughs> let's apply for it as a joke. Mm -hmm. um, so then I started typing it out and I said in a headshot. Then they asked me for more information. And I'm like, what? Actually, because I mean, I know so many hosts here that were great, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd never hosted actually on TV. Mm -hmm. And then next thing they offered me the job. I was okay. like, what? Um, and then I came home. And it was a great time because I was going through a breakup. So I was like miserable at that time. Oh. And so I could like go out and leave Kampala and not have to think about that. Mm -hmm. And like see these amazing things in my home country that I'd never seen. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us have never left much of like yes. Most Kampala, people say Kampala or our village. They, or they'll say they've gone to Ginger and Yeah, and, and far. Ginger <laughs> and your village at most. Mm -hmm. But... It was it was a beautiful gift and I loved I loved working with Pearl Guide. I loved working with Media Two Five Six. And what's been great is I've kept those working relationships. So I work with Isaac Aboth quite a lot. Okay. He's who I shot Wake Up George the Poet video with. Mm -hmm. Um and I've kept my relationship with Pearl Guide as well. So I was kinda disappointed that the Ministry of Tourism wouldn't have wanted to come in for a second season because I thought it was great. I thought it, w it really showed off Uganda mm -hmm. in an interesting way. So hopefully they'll rethink that. Okay, all right. And speaking of that breakup, how long were you with that person? Oh, unofficially or officially? <laughs> I think we want to know both now. <laughs> oh, man. I think unofficially was about four years <laughs> and then officially was about two and a half years. What does that mean, unofficially? Oh, Crystal, mm. you know what that I is. I don't know what that means. <laughs> You need to explain that to us Okay, right now. you know that time period before you decide you're going to be in a relationship. Mm -hmm. But you know, you know you're at SMSing. <laughs> <laughs> I even used that throwback term, SMSing. <laughs> yeah, so there was texting and WhatsApping, mm -hmm. you know, the good life. And then getting together, to get, but yeah, not like yeah. an yes. item. But then you... Then you're serious about, about it. About two and a half years together. Yeah, That's yeah. quite some time. That's too much time. Too much time. Oof. Oh, do you feel this person wasted your time? Was I it, don't. Was it a bad I breakup? Mean, I joke about it. Um, it wasn't. Um, it could have been worse, but it was definitely not a great. What did you learn great. from it? What did you learn from oh, it? Oh, I learned so much about myself. I learned that um, I shouldn't put other people first. Okay. Um, because what ha what happens in breakups, I've noticed, is that people become the most selfish versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like everyone's so raw, everyone's so emotional. And so what ended up happening was I was sacrificing a lot of who I was. The breakup wasn't rough. It was the time after the breakup, I would say. Okay. So there was a lot of like, you know, sacrificing who you are, trying to appease someone else, trying to make sure everything's good and so what i learned is i'll never do that again <laughs> i will always put myself first okay. and it's not being selfish mm -hmm. it's, it's self-care okay self-care taking care of yourself yes. first so are you in a relationship now oh no i think I'm i not. saw you saying uh, that you haven't been in a relationship for a long time i haven't i haven't been in a relationship oh Ooh, I, I, I just <laughs> remembered something <laughs> I haven't been in a real relationship <laughs> in a while, in like uh, three years. Okay. I haven't been in a real relationship for three years. Because I think after that breakup, I really found out who I was. Mm -hmm. And I started to, for the first time, like myself. I okay. don't know if that makes sense. But I actually like really started oh, to... Oh, you started to feel comfortable alone? No, but like enjoyed myself. Like I was like... I think you're a great person. And before, <laughs> I don't think I would have said that about myself. Um, but then also, like, right now, my what are, my career is very demanding. Mm -hmm. I, I barely have time for myself. Mm -hmm. And so when I do, I, like, treasure it so much that I can't imagine sharing that little time with someone else. Okay. And, and so I'm just not in that place mm -hmm. right now. So if you were to... Aside from my relationship with Idris Elba. <clears throat> this questionable one-sided <laughs> relationship no it's actually a three-way <laughs> relationship <laughs> so let me just ask you kemi i mean if you were like you talked about what you learned about yourself based on that breakup i won't ask details who he was but if you were to advise 
uh, a woman in a relationship right now, apart from self care, what yeah. else would you say? Because you're a feminist. Yes. So a woman breaking up, or, or just a just woman who's in a, in a healthy relationship. What would you define as a healthy relationship? I would define a healthy relationship. You know, people who like to say you complete me. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's a healthy <laughs> relationship. <laughs> I think you need to be whole, mm-hmm. and I think the other person needs to be whole, and you need to exist together and create something new. Okay. Um, to me, that's a, I know it's a metaphor, <laughs> but that's a healthy relationship. And I think for women in relationships, I think y- again, you you can't sacrifice yourself. I think there are times you're going to sacrifice for kids and for marriage, and I totally understand mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. But it has to be an equal sacrifice, and it can't always be coming from your part. And so, I guess my advice: what? what clearly, I'm not the best. <laughs> at, I mean, I haven't been in a really. I don't know what the game's like now. But <laughs> I think I think my advice would be would be to put yourself. At the same level as you put your partner. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'll ask you for your next song right now. Yes. Something from the amazingly talented Sandra Subi. Yes, and see me. It's mm-hmm. one of my songs I listen to every morning. <laughs> Tell me, after you did discover Uganda, yes, what was your next step? What what happened after that? So when I did discover Uganda, I was in my final year of grad school. Okay. So I went back to the states, mm-hmm. and I thought I was coming back in nine months, but at the end of our grad school, we do what they call a showcase. Mm-hmm. So you go and you perform like two, three minute skits in front of like executives and agents and i already knew i wasn't gonna get anything because i was like no because i felt that oh i had a different look and i was just like uh if you're not american there's extra paperwork and a lot of people told me oh international students it's really hard so i'd already been like nah yeah i'm going home this is not what it is Mm -hmm. and then of course god has his own plans mm-hmm. and I got an overwhelming response and so um, we got a great agent out there and so I decided it would only be right to at least do a year mm-hmm. so I stayed in LA uh, did the whole auditioning thing but still something didn't feel completely right I felt like in LA I was just an actor and I wasn't writing and I wasn't really doing everything that I could do Mm -hmm. with my art. I was just like waiting for a phone call from my agent. So I decided it would be best, you know, take a year or two, Mm -hmm. come back home and start some projects that I really wanted to take on. Okay. So I came back in June. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, this is the first interview I did when I came back. I (laughs) I came back and I did an interview here four days later. Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) And um, I came back in June. And then I did a bunch of filming and so forth. So that's what I've been doing. And okay. then I started Akadope. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that, you know, you're passionate about poetry, about the arts, yeah. about music. And then you started this project, Akadope, which yes. is once a month. Yes. And it's all about showcasing local musicians. Yes. People you wouldn't normally have access to. Right. Mm-hmm. So, again, it falls into my narrative of uh, changing the narrative. Mm-hmm. So I believe that here in Uganda we have this narrative that we have five musicians like <laughs> I can name them five you big know, five artists five talented artists mm-hmm. you know the rest are upcoming they're not as talented or whatever but that's not the truth we mm-hmm. have very many talented artists and that was a, a narrative that was sold to me until I was at a wedding and I saw more roots mm-hmm. and I'm like was oh mind my blown mm-hmm. and I'm like why don't I know who you are and who are you and, and what I was very overwhelmed by her (laughs) and then i started to actually have a personal relationship with her Mm -hmm. and then i realized there's more more roots (laughs) there's like sandra suvi and there's solomon (laughs) there's kenneth mugabe and i was like no 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 we need to start doing this platform where people 
can come every month and you know have a chance to see that we are very talented there's a plethora of artists yes it's not it's not the regular you no. know music that you listen to on the radio and then you've also gone for like you know the spoken word as well yes so it's very different yeah i try to incorporate spoken word rap art um um we used to have a live artist. I need to bring that back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just, you know, song. So w- what it has turned into is like seeing, like seeing people talk about these artists on Twitter on the, that weekend is always amazing to me. Because what I do think is that, so like people in the soul world mm-hmm. know more roots. Yes. People in the rap world know these rappers. People in the spoken word know Jason and Tara. Mm-hmm. But then their audiences aren't overlapping yes. because there's poetry events. I'm like, nah, Katogo like my... Let's put it all Katogo together. Katogo like my dad. <laughs> Let's put it all together and see what happens. And, and you were recently, you got some good attention, I think. Uh, I did? You were featured by... Is it the BBC? Oh, CNN. You see, she's really yes. forgotten. Oh, she's uh, like, oh, <laughs> what, what, who? Oh, yes, actually, April 28th, my yes. episode of African Voices will be airing on CNN. Okay, you yes. see. Thanks for remembering. I was like, <laughs> where? <laughs> <laughs> well, Kemi, it's been lovely having yes, you. Thank, thank you so much you. for coming back thank to you. the station. It's been fun. And um, you mentioned that you have a film coming out, so we can look forward to lots more. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Mm-hmm. In May, I'll be doing a launch uh, for chemistry class it might be in June but let's just say it's May for now Okay. Um, where I'll be launching a bunch of projects that I've been working on mm-hmm. um, so chemistry class will be my content production mm. um, yeah Okay. so look out for that April 28th CNN Akadope April 7th <laughs> <laughs> look at her <laughs> dropping all the dates <laughs> <laughs> okay just one last thing one last thing yes I asked you about like you know what is your definition of a healthy relationship yes. but on this journey in life, like you said, when you look back at your 17-year-old self, you were so daring. You were yes. willing to just go out and do things. What have you learned along the way? Um, I think the main thing I've learned is that you are the most, sounds so not deep, but you're <laughs> the most awesome pe- person that you could ever meet. And I think when you dare to find out who you are, mm-hmm. the ugly, you know, the parts that make you squirm, um, the parts that are embarrassing, you start to find the funny side of you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, on Snapchat, I just tell stories of failures and people, and I find humor in it now. Um, if we speak of Akadope, we once had the lovely Isaiah Katuma mm-hmm. to come and grace our stage. A lot of people were like, how did you do that? I'm like, I asked. You asked? And I, was, I thought he was going to say no, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I'd say, get over the fear of no, get over the fear of rejection, and hold the vision and trust the process. Trust the process. <laughs> yes. So I'll ask you now for your last song, which <laughs> is something that is very special to you. Yes. So Brand New by Kanji. Actually, I heard this song on Sanyu uh, <laughs> in 2014. And that, I think, was the beginning of me finding out who I was. Okay. Uh, that was a very special and hard year for me. And this song I used to play every single day. It was also the song, the first song I performed. And I don't consider myself a singer, so it was also this really vulnerable, weird thing. (laughs) And um, basically, this song talks about choosing yourself. It talks about giving yourself a new chance to reinvent yourself. And yeah, I just think... I'm in love with myself, and I hope <laughs> everyone finds that love within themselves. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, thanks again for coming through. Pleasure yes. having you. Thank and you. And we'll keep in touch. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> All right. Here it is from Kanji. Brand new day. Told my former self I was leaving. Better stand my 